This short video is about the working memory model, uh, most closely associated with Alan Badley's research. Um, and I'm going to situate it sort of within the broader context of uh, short-term and long-term memory, uh, and also talk about how it accounts for some basic psychological data. Uh, so if you were in my class on Wednesday, October 13th, we did a demonstration of the serial position effect. So serial position effect is a fairly well-known uh, and easy to reproduce uh, finding. Uh, and the basic idea is, if you didn't see the demonstration, uh, you're asked to learn a list of 20 or more words. So a list that exceeds uh, your capability to rehearse, right? So a long list of words, and then I ask you to recall that list. And the common finding is that people are better at remembering the words at the beginning of the list and at the end of the list and not so much at the middle of the list. So we show a serial position where good performance at the beginning, good performance at the end, and not so good uh, in the middle. So the question we have then is, how do we account for this pattern of results uh, within different contexts or different models or theories of short-term and long-term memory? So let's look at some hypothetical data of a serial position effect. So on the y-axis, the left axis there, you'll see hypothetically uh, the percentage of words recalled across a serial position effect experiment. Uh, and at the beginning, we've got about 75% uh, percent correct, and that's about the same for the words at the end of the list. On the x-axis, at the bottom there, you'll see the serial position. In other words, the order in which the words were originally learned. So you're always learning them in this order. You can see the performance is good for words 1, 2, and 3, not so good uh, for words uh, 4 through 13, and then it improves for 13, 14, and 15. So those are the two parts of the serial position effect. So we can refer to these by uh, these names. So the primacy effect, or the primacy curve, part of the curve, and the recency effect, or the recency portion of the serial position curve. The primacy effect refers to good performance on the words at the beginning, the first words you start to rehearse. The recency effect uh, refers to those were the perf good performance on the words at the end, the ones that were most recent uh, when you were asked to recall. So one of the things that seems clear is that we've got to have some way to account for these two different ends of the serial position curve. Uh, it can't just be that we rehearse the words, because if we're just rehearsing the words, uh, then we would assume that maybe the primacy words, the early words, get rehearsed a little bit more, and you would see a gradual uh, degradation of performance. So just rehearsal alone or exposure alone might help to explain the primacy portion of the curve, but doesn't explain the recency effect. If it just means that words are active uh, in your uh, mental space or active in your working memory, uh, you've heard them more recently, uh, then that would account for the recency effect, but it doesn't explain the primacy effect. In other words, we kind of need two different aspects or two different components of a memory theory. When this uh, uh, finding was originally discovered, uh, sort of in the golden era of, co golden era of cognitive psychology, so uh, in that information processing era, it gave rise to a model called the modal model, which we talked briefly about come back to in another few slides. But let's talk about how we can uh, differentially affect these parts of the serial position curve. So some manipulations, experimental manipulations, affect the primacy uh, effect only and leave the recency effect uh, undamaged. Other manipulations would affect the recency effect and not the primacy effect. Uh, and let's look at those. So, for example, suppose uh, we ask people to learn the list of words. So they hear the list of words, uh, and then after they get the last word, one of three things can happen. First of all, they just, it's a control condition, we ask them to immediately recall the words. That's your standard serial position effect, shown in here with the large dashed line. Uh, so good performance at the beginning, good performance at the end. We can also ask uh, subjects to wait 30 seconds and do nothing. Uh, so they hear the words, they try to memorize them, uh, 30 seconds goes by after the last word, and then they recall the words. Uh, that's shown by the solid line, the 30-second unfilled delay. Uh, or they can also have a delay, but that delay is filled with other information, other words being presented. What we see here is that 
the immediate condition, the control condition, and the unfilled delay condition don't really differ from each other. In other words, there's a primacy effect and a recency effect, but the filled delay uh, damages the performance on the recency effect only, but it leaves the primacy effect uh, in place. And what that suggests is that hearing that additional information kind of moves those recent words out of the out of your buffer, out of the working memory buffer, which we'll explain in, in a few slides. So you were able to rehearse those words at the beginning uh, because they were the first ones you heard. And as, you, as that list goes by, you start to say those words. Uh, that's the primacy portion. At the end, when it's an unfilled delay, you can continue to rehearse the words that you know at the beginning and the words that you most recently heard. So anything that sticks, you can keep rehearsing, right? But when that delay is filled, you can't do that rehearsal. Those original words at the beginning have been rehearsed enough so that you can still recall them, but the words at the end haven't been, and that's why performance suffers with that filled delay. So what could we do that would affect the primacy effect but not the recency effect? Well, one thing might be something that would uh, inhibit your ability to rehearse the words at the beginning. In other words, something that would make it harder to start saying those words to yourself as you hear them. One thing you can do that is to speed up the presentation. So if we present the words at the normal rate, that's the solid line, that's our slower presentation, you see a primacy effect and a recency effect. If we present the words at a faster rate, uh, it seems to interfere with or reduce performance on the primacy effect also in the middle, but at the end, when those words are still active uh, in your uh, sensory memory, uh, they're able to be recalled. So a fast presentation uh, seems to damage the primacy effect and the central part of the curve, but it doesn't seem to have a strong effect on that recency portion of the curve. So what this suggests, and what this suggested to psychologists uh, when they discovered this, was uh, this serial position effect uh, suggests two different kinds of memory storage systems. The primacy effect represents or uh, suggests the existence of a long-term memory store, that you've rehearsed those words long enough that they've become strong enough uh, in your long-term memory that you can recall them later even with a filled delay and even with other stuff. For example, if you were in class on Wednesday, you could probably recall the first two or three words uh, in that list. Uh, that we presented at the end of the uh, uh, at, at the end of the class, so they're probably still in there. Uh, a long delay wouldn't make a difference. They've already been transferred into some kind of long-term store. The recency effect represents or comes about because of items that are still in the short-term memory buffer that you use to rehearse. Uh, they haven't been written over or pushed out or uh, interfered with, so they're still there, uh, and you can recall those well problem is the words in the middle, right? They haven't been rehearsed long enough uh, or in enough detail to be able to remember most of them, but they're also no longer in your short-term short memory buffer, uh, so you can't rehearse them. Uh, they've not made it into long-term memory, and they're no longer in short-term memory, so that's why performance uh, dips in that middle portion of the curve. Now, there's a little bit more subtleness to this uh, effect, uh, as we'll explain later when we talk about working memory, but this suggested these two memory stores. And so one of the original models of memory, uh, which was sort of popular in the late 1960s and into the 1970s, this is Atkinson and Schifrin's modal model. Uh, and it kind of suggested that there are two uh, primary memory stores. Uh, we'll call one of them primary memory or short-term memory. Uh, and this has this limited capacity where you can rehearse things. Uh, if you don't rehearse them, they fade. Information decays because it's written over by new information. So if you hear new words coming in, uh, what's in short-term memory is going to disappear. You can maintain it by using an inner voice, for example. You can say those numbers or words or letters to yourself. Uh, but if other information comes in, it kind of pushes it out. It only holds so many things, seven plus or minus two pieces of information. We'll talk about that in a minute. At the same time, we can transfer stuff by rehearsing it enough into long-term memory. We can rehearse it by saying it, we can rehearse it by imagining it, or we can rehearse it by thinking about what it means, and that's called elaborative rehearsal. I'll have more to say about elaborative rehearsal uh, and levels of processing uh, in another lecture. 
that helps you get information into long-term memory. And once it's established in long-term memory, uh, it doesn't decay uh, right away. Now, it can still decay, and you can still forget things, but uh, it isn't overwritten by new information as soon as you hear it, the way it seems to be in primary memory or short-term memory. Uh, this secondary memory or long-term memory is a larger store. It seems to be unlimited, uh, and you can get information in there by rehearsing it or thinking about it uh, or trying to uh, learn it. So let's answer some questions about short-term memory. So we've already talked a little bit about long-term memory when we talked about uh, concepts and categories and knowledge structures. Let's talk about the components or the characteristics or the properties of short-term memory. Uh, so how short is it? That's one of the questions we want to answer. Uh, how is the information stored and how is it transferred? Uh, I want to cover the first two of these in this lecture. We'll talk more about the transfer of information in a subsequent uh, lecture when we talk about uh, elaborative rehearsal, maintenance rehearsal, um, levels of elaboration, and levels of processing. So for right now, we want to talk about how short is the information and how is it stored. So it's short. Uh, this is one of the one of the sort of canonical or original findings in cognitive psychology. Uh, and that is that if you're given a short piece of information, uh, you can hold on to it for a few seconds, uh, two or three seconds, uh, and then it starts to fade, unless you can do something to keep it there. So when I say to do something to keep it there, I usually mean some kind of sub-vocal rehearsal. Uh, this is a study from uh, Peterson and Peterson. Uh, this is called the Brown-Peterson paradigm, uh, and two different groups of researchers, uh, Brown and Peterson and Peterson, uh, figured out how to uh, measure uh, the sort of duration of a single trace. Um, and what they asked uh, their subjects to do, so this is a figure from uh, their original paper from 1959. Um, and you can see on the top there it says seconds, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so on. Uh, then there's an E and an S. The E is what the experimenter says, and the S is what the subject or the participant does. Uh, and so what the subjects did, and what the experimenter did, is they would give the subject a three-letter string uh, that was not a word, so CHJ. They would say CHJ to you, and then a second later, they would say 506, and your job was to count backwards by threes uh, until a certain duration, until the experimenter told you to recall the letters. So you would get, experimenter would say CHJ, 506, and then you would say 506, 503, 500, 497, whatever the next number is. It's not easy to do, right? It requires a little bit of effort to count backwards by threes from a three-digit number. Then a few seconds later, you would be asked to recall that original CHJ. And what we want to know is um, for these recall intervals, and they space their recall intervals out from three seconds to uh, 18 seconds, how long can they retain this CHJ while they're simultaneously counting backwards? It should be possible. You should be able to say CHJ 506, CHJ 503, CHJ 500, CHJ 497. Can you do that, though? Uh, you're not actually saying CHJ. You're just counting out loud. So you'd have to say one of them quietly to yourself or visualize it or something while you're doing that backward counting task. So in other words, what they've done is they've given you a piece of information, and then they've interfered with your ability to rehearse it so that they can measure how long does that information stay if it can't be rehearsed. And the answer is not very long. Uh, so on the y-axis, they've labeled it relative frequency here, but uh, this translates into proportion correct recall. Um, you can see that at zero seconds, uh, people are about 90% correct. They don't get them all all the time. Uh, by three seconds, it's probably enough time to only say two or three digits. Performance is down to about 50%, uh, then 40%, uh, and so on. Uh, performance degrades, uh, and so they're unable to recall these um, digits. By 18 seconds, the trace is essentially vanished. Uh, this is not something that sticks around. So information in your short-term memory, or in this uh, primary memory, really does need to be rehearsed. This task interferes with your ability to rehearse it. How much information is stored? Well, we've already talked a little bit about this. Uh, we suggested, again, another canonical finding from the early era, information processing era of cognitive psychology. Uh, George Miller suggested that we can encode about seven, plus or minus two, 
things, uh, seven digits, seven letters, seven words, uh, seven names. Uh, and Miller suggests that we can chunk things together. So we can store between five to nine chunks of information, and these can be uh, any kind of chunk. What this suggests, though, is that if you can put things into bigger chunks, you can remember more things, right? Um, just as a, a really straightforward and simple example. If I ask you to remember the string 1491625364964, you would be unable to get past a few numbers, right? Uh, that's a long, seemingly random string of numbers. Now, you won't get more than five to seven numbers of that, right? Uh, you'd be able to rehearse it, and then at about five to seven to nine numbers, you would lose the ability to keep it going. All right, so you, I mean, it's probably a reason why phone numbers are seven numbers long for the most part, right? We've got an area code and seven numbers. Any longer than that, and you wouldn't be able to remember it long enough uh, to uh, write it down if you've heard it. However, you could remember more numbers if you chunk them differently. So if you insert a comma, and you remember them as 149, 16, 25, 36, that's now a different chunk. So 25 here is a single piece of information. It's a chunk, whereas 2 and 5 are two chunks. So you chunk things together. Uh, you can remember them in different ways. When you remember your social insurance number, for example, you probably remember the chunks of numbers and not all the numbers individually. If you remember your student number, or if you remember your license plate number, or any kind of number like that, you might remember chunks of information rather than the entire uh, string. Now, of course, you can chunk things even uh, better than that. You can remember the entire string of numbers by uh, introducing some emergent property or an additional piece of information, remembering that it is 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, and 4 squared, lets you remember the entire string with essentially two chunks of information. Increasing numbers squared. Uh, so that requires some additional computation, but it lets you remember a longer string. But without these chunks, uh, your short-term memory is pretty limited. The best that I've labeled here, which is the uh, numbers squared, requires some additional knowledge. In other words, a contribution of long-term memory and long-term knowledge intruding on your short-term knowledge. So we've covered um, how short uh, the, the information is stored uh, for a few seconds. Uh, we've talked about how you can chunk things, so the format of the information in terms of uh, its abstract nature, its chunks of information that are rehearsed in order. Uh, we've talked about how that uh, implies a serial position effect, a short-term memory and a long-term memory. Um, so how is the information actually represented? What's the nature of the representation? Um, one possibility, and what seems to be uh, you know, uh, the approach that's taken by this working memory model, which I'll introduce in just a slide, uh, is the idea that information can be both auditory and visual. Now, this should remind you of uh, Brooks's, uh, Lee Brooks's work, uh, the experiment we talked about a few weeks ago, uh, where we suggested that there are different attentional or processing pools, right? So that you can pay attention to the uh, verbal nature of something, remember a sentence and respond yes or no, or you can pay attention to and process the visual spatial information, so imagining something happening in a visual spatial uh, representation and then respond in a motoric or visual spatial way. And that when those things interfere, you see a drop in performance. And that suggests that we have the ability uh, to remember auditory and verbal information or acoustical information and also visual spatial information. So this is all brought together in Badley's working memory model. So Badley's working memory model, uh, definitely one of the most influential uh, theories of memory and attention uh, that have been introduced in the last 20 or 30 years. So uh, this model goes back to work in the 1970s, uh, but a lot of the heavy development was done in the 1980s. Still a very dominant uh, you know, paradigm or theory uh, in the field, and you've probably heard the term, even if you never took a psychology class, there's a good chance you've heard people talk about working memory capacity or working memory score. So Badley's working memory model, though, is uh, sort of a three or four part model. Um, and the assumption is that working memory holds information from perception. It's got to have somewhere to go. So whether you're using that modal model uh, that we talked about earlier today, or 
uh, some of the other approaches we've discussed. We've got an early sensory process and then some kind of limit, right? It can be an early selection or a late selection, uh, but we all acknowledge there's a lot of information coming in from perception and then there's a limit to what you can actually uh, use, right? So there's a limit to what you can actually perceive and process further. In order to do that, you've got to have a place to, your, you know, your brain has to have a way to store the information until it can make contact with or remind you of knowledge, right? So if you're listening to somebody talk, you've got to be able to take in those words, take in the sounds, uh, map them onto ideas and concepts so that you can build a mental model of what the person is saying to you. Uh, you need some way to be able to keep that information active long enough. Because remember, as soon as you've heard something, uh, it's disappeared from the world. So the signal is no longer there. All that is left is what's in your brain. Uh, so we need to be able to keep that active long enough so that we can uh, understand what the sentence is and we can fit the words together and the ideas together so that we can create uh, a concept or a mental model of what someone else is saying to us. So working memory is a proposed system for this. It holds information from perception. Uh, it also allows you to hold information that you've retrieved from your permanent or long-term memory. So information coming in can be worked on. Information uh, retrieved can be worked on. Uh, and it assumes that there's some kind of central attention system that coordinates these different systems. And as you can see, uh, Badley has uh, sort of suggested there are three different ways in which our memory works. One is a visual spatial memory, which he originally named the uh, visual spatial sketch pad, which is a little corny sounding, I realize, but uh, it gets the idea that there's some kind of you know, visual spatial information like having a sketch pad that we can remember up and down and left and right and remember rotating things. So that's how we deal with visual spatial information uh, in our brains. There's also an episodic buffer which is uh, designed to help you encode new, uh, or assumed to design to help you encode new episodic memories. Uh, in other words, it keeps track of where you are and what time it is and it encodes the episodic nature uh, of the surroundings so that you can form a new episodic memory. Uh, at the same time, there's also a what's called a phonological loop. Uh, and this is the part of the working memory model which is the most well understood and most well studied, so we'll spend the most time on it. Uh, this is where you rehearse information. This is where you process things that you've heard when you're having a conversation so that you can build that mental model. So this lets you uh, replay or store acoustical or verbal information uh, until you can process it further. Uh, so this phonological store, let's start there. Uh, it holds acoustic or speech information for about two seconds, so it's got a limit. And that's where that limit of seven plus or minus two comes from. It takes you about two seconds to get through a list, right? Um, it seems to have an acoustical control process. Uh, it relies on inner speech. So the same processes and brain areas that you would use to speak uh, can also be used to use an inner voice. Uh, it's probably crucial for acquiring language to have some ability to keep information active before uh, you actually understand what's being said. Now, you've probably been in this situation, I don't, I don't know if you have, but I certainly have, where somebody said, I ask somebody a question, uh, or they ask me a question, and I don't quite hear what they said. So, somebody asks me a question, and I'll say, what did you say? And then before they answer, I... I'm able to replay that information in my head and say, oh yeah, oh, never mind, I got it. Uh, you've probably been in that situation where somebody says something to you, you don't understand, you ask them to repeat it, and before they repeat it, you've actually understood it. Right? So you're able to hear it uh, before you've understood it. You can keep it active to be able to decode it and understand it. That's your acoustical control process and the phonological loop. Uh, working to keep language information or sound information active so that you can decode it and understand it later. So there's a little bit of evidence, uh, well it's a lot of evidence, but let's review a little bit of the evidence for this system. Uh, one, this comes from Badley's work, is the word length effect. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you perform better when you have to remember a list of short words versus long words. Now the chunking idea su should suggest uh, that it would be equal, right? If it's just chunking uh, amodal information, in other words, chunks of information, pen, day, hot, cow, and tub is five chunks, university, tuberculosis, opportunity, hippopotamus, and refrigerator, 
five chunks. So if it's just amodal chunks, they should be equal, but what Badley found is that performance declines systematically with the length of the word. Uh, that suggested that it works like a loop. You can get to the end of the list and then you have to go back to the beginning of the list again. Uh, and you can do that more effectively with short words than with long words. By the time you get to the end of saying university tuberculosis opportunity hippopotamus refrigerator, you've run out of time. It's taken you more than two seconds. And so you don't get to the top of the list and refresh it as effectively as you would with pende hot, pende hot cow tub, right? So this word length effect uh, is some of the earliest evidence for this phonological loop. Uh, Badley also discovered a phonological similarity effect. So immediate serial recall is impaired uh, when uh, items or words are similar in sound. In other words, people make confusions uh, or they make errors when they're recalling words that are the same. Uh, the more similar the words are, the harder it is to be able to recall them. Uh, and that's because you're using this phonological loop or this phonological store to rehearse them. It makes it easier to make mistakes on things that sound alike than on things that are different. Uh, an irrelevant sound effect. So immediate recall is impaired. This is that uh, field delay that we talked about um, on uh, serial position effect. Immediate recall is impaired by the concurrent or subsequent presentation of irrelevant spoken material. That's exactly the uh, 30 second field delay that we talked about with serial position. You got a list of words, then there's some irrelevant information. It uh, interferes with that recency curve, uh, and it suggests that the phonological loop is no longer able to keep up with rehearsing those words because in addition to rehearsing the words, it's also taking in words from the outside. And as you hear those words, it interferes with your ability to rehearse. So that's some uh, fairly strong evidence. This uh, working memory span, usually when people talk about working memory span, they often mean uh, the phonological loop, the number of words you can recall, or the number of led letters you can recall, or the number of operations that you can recall. Um, this working memory uh, system also has this visual spatial sketch pad, and we've talked about this already uh, when we discussed uh, visual imagery. Uh, so this is a system that allows you to uh, replay or represent or reactivate ideas within a visual spatial modality. Uh, so some of the evidence comes from the neuropsychology and the eye tracking literature, which we discussed in our uh, lecture on imagery. Uh, so this spatial information system also allows you to keep information active until you understand it. Uh, the last one I want to talk a little bit more about is the central executive. And this lines up with what we discussed uh, a few weeks ago when we talked about central attention. So this is mediated uh, by your prefrontal cortex. And this is where you get things like cognitive control. So being able to activate the phonological loop and continue to make it rehearse, right? Uh, sure, information as you hear it enters the phonological loop, uh, but if you want to rehearse something and use that inner voice uh, to try to remember something, that takes some control. So something has to tell the phonological loop to keep working, and that's your central attention. Uh, also inhibition, so you can inhibit uh, information coming from the visual spatial sketch pad, or you can downplay uh, some of that information. You can work between two different systems uh, by selecting response from one or the other using your central attention. So badly central executive uh, maps onto a lot of what we've already discussed uh, with central attention. Okay, so that's all I have to say about the working memory model now. Um, in a subsequent lecture next week, we'll talk a little bit more about how to get information from your working memory system into your long-term memory. And that's going to be the content on maintenance rehearsal, elaborative rehearsal, and the levels of processing.